Hi, this is Pete Lyons with Let's Play Salesforce, and today we're doing Einstein Analytics SQL Basics, The Anatomy of a Query. So before we get started, I will say that if you're going through these videos and thinking, all right, this is cool, but I'm ready for the advanced stuff, what should I do next? My recommendation would be to uh, take apart some of the queries that are on the sales analytics dashboard. You can get to this from any trailhead. Um, I've got it installed here, uh, but yeah, this is where you're really going to start to see some real world examples of complex SQL in the wild and you can take them apart and see how they work. It's really great stuff. I highly recommend it. But getting started today, I'm logged in as Batman and I want to explore my DTC opportunity data set. Now, whenever we explore a data set, we are effectively asking our data questions. And this is in the form of queries that get translated into SQL, sent off to the server, and the server returns uh, your data in however, uh, whatever form you choose to visualize it. So the default query is just gonna be the count of rows um, completely uh, ungrouped or grouped by all, uh, however you wanna view that. So let's take a look at what the SQL editor has actually done here. Now we get the full query, all four lines of it up top, and then we see the table that is output by this. And then uh, that will then get turned into a visualization based on the chart properties we have applied. So let's look at this query uh, line by line. So first is Q equals load DTC opportunity sample. What does this mean? Well, Q is a variable. It's going to represent the table that uh, we're currently talking about, the table that's currently in memory. Uh, if we hop in back and forth between multiple variables, uh, the return is just going to be whichever one we referenced last. And with each statement that our SQL query is constructed out of, the shape and nature of that data will change, and certain steps must be taken along the way, or it won't be able to return. So for example, if I try to run this query right now, the, there's no query to run. So let's start adding things back one line at a time. Well, next we've got Q equals group Q by all. Okay, so this means we're going to flatten our data into just one row, group, the, group all of our data together. And this is still not enough of a query for the system to run because once our data is grouped, okay, well, what do you want to know about it? We need to have some columns. Right now our table has no columns. So if we add back the projection, Q equals for each Q, generate count uh, as count, now we should actually be able to see some data. And we do. So what's going on here? First, we said take our table, flatten it down to one row. That was Q equals group Q by all. Now for each of those Qs, now there's only one of them, we need to do some generating. And we need to, uh, to generate some columns within that data set. Now count is the most simple uh, function that's available to us. Anytime that you see these parentheses, that's a, a function. We're going to be doing some kind of aggregation or some kind of operation on our data. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of available SQL functions. This is the most basic. It takes no arguments, so there's nothing in the parentheses, and it simply returns the count of rows. Now, uh, when we move forward and we start looking at things like sums and averages, the reason why we must use these functions is because if, if we just say, okay, well, give me the amount. Well, the amount of what? Like, I've got multiple rows here. Do I return the amount of the first row, the largest row, uh, the sum of all, or the average of all? And that's when we'll start getting into uh, arguments. Then the last thing that the default query is going to have is it is going to include a limit of 2,000. And technically, all queries have this limit on them, but how is it that you're able to see, well, far more rows than that? Well, because this has to do with, in the back end, how all of this aggregation is done, and ultimately, we are only going to be presenting 2,000 rows of the finished product. In our case, we've only got one row. Now, it doesn't matter how many opportunities are actually contained within that. Once we group it by all, there's really only one row of data. And when we say limit Q 2,000, we're saying only show me the first 2,000 Qs. In our case, we only have one. Now, uh, if you don't actually explicitly put this limit in your query, for example, if I create my visualization through the UI and I say group by account, and in my case, I have 100,000 accounts, it's not gonna stop at the first 2,000. You can keep scrolling, and as soon as it hits 2,000 without you even asking, it'll load up the next 2,000 into memory. So there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors that, that goes on there to uh, help the system run efficiently. Uh, the important takeaway is that whenever you switch to SQL mode, by default, it's going to apply a hard limit of 2,000 uh, for your output. So now let's take a look at a query that has a little more meat to it. 
So I'm going to back to my lens editor. I'm going to group by stage on my vertical axis. I'm going to change my measure to average of amount. I'm going to sort that descending. And now let's take a look at our new query. So now in our new query, we see a few things that are different. First, instead of grouping by all, we are grouping by stage. So our output for this is around nine rows. And that limit down there of 2000, it does not apply to the original number of rows in our DTC opportunity sample. It applies to the number of rows in table Q uh, after its most recent grouping. So in this case, that stage, we have one row per stage. So then in our generate statement, we need to call out uh, that we want to be able to see that stage column. So we have to generate stage as stage. Now we can easily change the name to this. And that will change the name of our column header. But it's important to be mindful that what you have effectively done now is created a calculated column that does not exist natively in your data set. So any formatting options that you're doing through the XMD, such as custom color or number formats, will be lost as soon as you make that change. You'll get the column header you want. It'll return the data that you need, but it is no longer the same column in the XMD. And if you want to be able to use formatting options, you'll need to add this to the derived uh, section of the XMD, either derived dimensions or derived measures, depending on what it is. Next, we see an aggregate function that actually has something in the arguments. We have the AVG function, which takes all of the different cells in a given uh, column, and it averages their numerical values together. In this case, the argument that we pass it is the amount column, and that is projected as AVG underscore amount. And again, it needs to be in this format or the system won't know that we're talking about the average amount. So we have this nice formatting here and it's automatically truncating off of our uh, truncating off the cents that are involved. And uh, also importantly, our next statement, we're ordering by this AVG under amount. So any changes we make here are going to need to be propagated further down the query. So if I change this to average of amount, the first thing it's going to do is throw an error because in the very next uh, statement, we're saying order by AVG amount, but we don't have this field within uh, the data table queue. So we'll need to make sure that this change is reflected in the order statement as well and anywhere else afterwards that we're uh, you know, calling on that field. So if I change this to average amount here, that'll allow my query to run, but notice now I've lost my numerical formatting. So this is no longer comma delimited at the thousands. And now I have uh, a long decimal place running off the, uh, the, the edge of the column here. And it'll give me as many decimals until we hit uh, our 18 character cap on a numerical field. So, uh, you know, again, if, you, if all you're trying to do is change a column header, uh, you know, this might not be the, the, the best thing to do. But you can also use different SQL functions like string to number, number to string to correct the formatting, or you can go into your XMD and add uh, a section in the section derived measures. You can add an entry for this average amount field that you've created here. Uh, you know, you can also, if you wanted to just clean it up a little bit, we can check out another SACL function called truncate. And truncate takes two arguments. The first is going to be, well, what is it that we need to truncate? And the second is going to be how many decimal places do we want to truncate that to? So if I take this average amount and I drop this in as the first argument of truncate, and then I put that right back where that was, the expected behavior is that uh, on proposal slash price quote, we're only going to see the first two seven here, and it's not just going to go two seven, two seven, two seven repeating. So let's try that out. And it works. Uh, so again, before you start messing with uh, the, the, the body of this SQL query, just be aware that uh, if you change any column names, it is going to have uh, a, a less than pleasant visual result if you are not willing to do the extra work to clean it up afterwards. Another really cool thing that you can do to mess with this right here, let's take a look at if we reduce this limit to say three. Now again, this limit applies to the current state of Q, which is one row per stage. We are not saying only give me the first three opportunities. We are saying only give me the first three stages. 
So if we run the query, we see that everything except for needs analysis, proposal price quote, and perception analysis drops straight off the list. Now, once we've started messing around with the, the SACL and modifying it directly, we can still switch back to table mode, but all of uh, our filters and everything, this is now read only. We can't do anything to modify the query from the UI. Uh, so that is a limitation that you're going to want to be aware of, but we can still hit the back button and go back to a simpler query that was supported by the UI. And now we can make additional modifications. So let's look at how a filter is going to manifest. So if I said I only want to see open opportunities, let's take a look at the filter it creates. Now the filter is being applied before we do any groupings or any projections. That's because the system wants to be as efficient as possible. So it wants to always try to reduce the number of rows that it has to deal with. Uh, before performing any aggregation or any kind of transformation of your data. So the filters are always going to be as high up as possible. Uh, there are instances where uh, you will need to filter after your projection. These are called post-projection filters, and they will be covered in a different video in this series. Uh, but right off the bat, this is where your filters are going to go. Uh, occasionally, the question comes up, is it better to have multiple filter statements uh, so I would do Q equals filter, Q by closed equals false, then Q equals Q by stage equals prospect analysis. Uh, but, you know, or do I want to just have Q equals filter, Q by closed equals false, and stage equals prospect analysis? The answer is, it's always best to try to keep your filters in as few statements as possible. And also, to it, when you do have multiple filters, uh, multiple filter statements, you want to order them that the first filters are going to reduce your data volume uh, the most substantially. Anytime you can reduce the size of that table, the next statement has fewer rows that it needs to process on, and each statement is run independently. So, two filters that do, you know, two filter statements that. Uh, filter the data to the exact same result as one filter statement that includes the criteria of both, the one that's only one statement is going to be more efficient, uh, although you may not actually observe a difference in runtime, uh, simply in that we are reducing the query volume uh, or the, the data volume uh, to a, a smaller amount and we are performing fewer steps in the process. Interestingly enough, though, this is not actually what the system will do when you get auto-generated SACL like this. So let's flip back to our uh, lens editor. And again, because we have made no modifications to the SACL, we are still able to edit it in the UI. And I'm going to filter by account type equals customer, apply that, hop back to SACL. So this is what I'm, I'm describing here. It created a second filter uh, statement. So technically, this is two operations. First, we're cutting our data by saying only show me the ones where closed equals false. And then on that reduced pool of data, we're saying uh, filter where account type equals customer. And if I wanted to include this in the criteria, clip that out, I'd add my double ampersand. It also supports the word and, either will work. And I would include my filter criteria right here and simply get rid of this additional statement. So this modified query is technically more efficient than the auto-generated SQL we just saw, even though it will give us the exact same result. So now I'm going to back up a little bit because if I switch back to my editor, I will no longer be able to use the UI uh, to make modifications. So I'm going to get rid of both of these filters and show you how different date filters work. So for example, uh, relative date filters and uh, absolute filters are going to be passed in a different way. So right now I'm saying uh, close year is going to be last year or this year. I'll go ahead and apply my filter. First, let's take a look at the way that this manifests in the compact form. So here's my filters section, and I'm basically saying the, the year of the close date is one ago to the year of the close date is zero. Uh, and if we wanted to do um, mixed uh, grains on this. For example, I wanted to say one year ago until today, not until the end of this calendar year. I do have the ability to do that. There's nothing in the UI that will let you do that. This is a good use case for why I would need to make subtle tweaks to my JSON directly. Uh, so just showing that that works. And now let's take a look at what would happen if we instead 
used an absolute date range. So just some random old dates here. If I did it this way instead, <clears throat> now I'm filtering by uh, the actual epic seconds, and this is returned in epic milliseconds. So this number right here, everything except the last three zeros, this is the number of seconds that has passed since January 1st, 1970. Um, and we're hard coding in these numerical values, and that's how we apply our date filters. So let's take a look at the two different forms and how they appear in SACWL. So for the absolute version, we see date, and we have to pass in the subdate fields of close date year, close date month, and close date day are within a date range of fixed values. Now in this case, it's not using those epics. It's literally calling out in the same format that we have, what is the year, what is the month, what is the day? And that's how it applies the filter for that. By contrast, when we go to our relative date values, I'll do the same one that I did before, last year to this year, we get a different syntax. We still call out or we still call out our date in the exact same way because we have to say like, you know, this is this is what my date field actually is because uh, Einstein Analytics does not actually know what a date is at its core. It only understands uh, strings and measures. And anytime we're dealing with dates, there's actually a lot of really impressive behind the scenes juggling that happens to make the system behave like it's a date, even though it's really just a collection of strings. And then we're able to pass in this relative filter that says one year ago to current year. And this is going to take the exact same syntax as you get in standard reports when you do like n days ago, um, you know, last n days, uh, filters like that. There's a really nice article uh, about that that covers all the different options that you can put in. Um, and we can also, in this case, we can also have open-ended ranges, which we are not able to do without the use of SACL. If I don't give it a start or end range, as long as I've got these two dots and I run my query, it still works. Let me see if I can show an example of something that's actually going to change the data. If I go dot dot right here and say, show me everything up until one, uh, one year ago, I'm imagining that these numbers are going to change. And they do. So that concludes the anatomy of the basic SACL query. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we will be covering in this series, which is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with SACL. So if you like this video, uh, please watch more. Please like, subscribe, uh, tell a friend, hit me up for stubborn determination on LinkedIn. And as always, thanks for watching.